Does a Donald Trump economy outweigh a Kamala Harris economy when it comes to real estate investing? Or what about for service members? How do you think life will be in the military depending on which person wins? Thank you for joining today. I'm Dave Perret, the Military Millionaire. We help service members and vets achieve financial freedom. And today we're gonna be diving into the political spectrum. We're gonna try to do this as unpolitically as possible, where you're gonna try to focus on the tax, economic, you know, whatever policies. And I'm gonna just throw this out there that this is more me kind of just throwing opinions and statements on the wall. And I'd love in the comments to hear y'all's belief. Let's be real. There are so many policies being proposed during the election. And this is what happens every year. We don't know what is bullshit, what's real. Um, you know, for example, uh, the Project 25 keeps getting thrown around despite the fact that the Republican side has said a hundred times over that's not Donald Trump's plan that's a think tank and that there are think tank plans by the Democratic Party that haven't been thrown. So we're going to get out of the like speculative, name calling, angry, aggressive, Trump is a this and Kamala didn't do this and, and whatever side of things and try to take the approach of just looking at their policies and what they may or may not do and what I think the effect could be depending on who wins the election. And we're not gonna talk about all the angry anti whatever and the feelings and the emotions and the fact that like realistically people might may just go and riot depending on who wins and, and all that crazy emotional stuff. We're gonna try to go with the logical approach. So we'll go with this. Very first thing, uh, Donald Trump admittedly very pro US based economy. So he wants to bring stuff back to America. Right? He wants to bring manufacturing in, he wants to bring... Now, there's pros and cons to this because American labor is more expensive. So admittedly, a company might have a lower product price if it's going to China, but if we bring everything in-house, we're self-sustained. So I think in order to do that, he would have to improve energy production. Right, So we would have to increase oil, i.e. gas and, and, and everything. We'd have to increase electric capabilities, solar, wind farms, whatever. Um, honestly, what I'd love to see here is I'd love to see nuclear. And I understand that nuclear power is scary to people. And I understand that nuclear power takes time to build. But if you haven't dug into it, <clears throat> Chernobyl scariness aside, which was, by the way, human error, that wasn't the plant, that was that was people not doing things the right way. Um, so Chernobyl scariness aside, nuclear power is the cleanest, most efficient source of energy we could possibly utilize. And so like our naval ships are powered with nuclear reactors. We have aircraft carriers, submarines, just traveling the globe on nuclear power, nuclear reactors. So we have the technology. Knock on wood, those ships haven't burned down due to a nuclear reactor in the last 20 years, right, that I know of. And so if we brought that power into the U.S., I think that would be huge. But then we've got, you know, fossil fuels. We've got oil and gasoline and diesel and all of these things which drive manufacturing. So I think if we brought the energy cost down dramatically, that would cut the cost of manufacturing, that would cut the cost of logistics, that would cut the cost of trans transportation. And then if you brought jobs in-house, that wouldn't hurt pricing as much as you think. So my, my thought here is that by being pro-U.S., self-sufficient energy and also pro manufacturing and, and everything in house and being more of a self-sufficient country, I think that maybe not completely, but kind of cancels each other out as far as cost of goods. Now, again, this is speculating. That's not my world of expertise. I'm making assumptions. Um, lower taxes for businesses and individuals. Like, I don't think you lose here. Tax, taxes being lowered is great. Um, I personally loved the Donald Trump tax cuts as far as like cost segregation and accelerated depreciation for real estate investors and real estate syndicators. I think that was huge. This allowed young investors to capitalize on tax benefits to both attract more investor like private money and also to roll into the next deal. So this stimulates the real estate side of the economy and between the, um, you know, the, the opportunity zones, which honestly was more of a Barack Obama thing, I believe, the opportunity zones. Um, but between opportunity zones and cost segregations, accelerated depreciation 100% year one, people are able to build a real estate portfolio and 
benefit the real estate market better. This incentivizes builders, this incentivizes commercial investors, this incentivizes and stimulates the housing, office, job, manufacturing, uh, real estate side of the economy. And I think that is huge because anything we can do, especially to incentivize home building, because we are drastically under supply, right? is going to reduce housing costs because of, I mean, supply and demand is ultimately the most natural, like arm, lever, however you wanna call it, in any sort of product-based or service-based economy. That is the like ground zero negotiation, like that's what pricing is based on, supply and demand. And so a million other things that play into that, but the more you can increase supply by building, the better. And on that same point, right, immigration, um, nothing against the immigration side, but the less people, the less population, the less whatever, also lowers the demand, which, so if you increase supply and you reduce demand, it evens out to a better pricing point than if you only do one or the other or you do neither. Um, and so I think the better immigration policies, which slows population growth from that side, and I'm not against immigration by any means, I'm just saying controlled, legal, you know, at a rate that we control is better than open border. And um, I say that as somebody who's both sets of grandparents immigrated to the country. In fact, my mom's parents immigrated twice because they came, they left, then they went, oh shit, we should have stayed, and they came again. And they all went through the legal process. And so I'm all for that. And I know it's not easy. Fewer people coming into the country that way lowers demand at least a little bit. And then supply increasing via less restrictions on building, more places to build, you know. And then obviously cost of goods for building will also go down with the ability to transport or manufacture in the country. So all of that kind of ties in to that economy side. Um, real estate investing friendly regulations, right? Cost segregation and all that, that's all great. Uh, infrastructure spending, you know, that's good, great, great for the grid, whatever. And then immigration. So we kind of talked about all that. It's funny. So I chat GPT like some bullet points to add to my own thoughts. And so like the cons of Donald Trump winning, some of these points are like, um, one of them is immigration policy. Strict immigration policies could slow population growth, reducing long-term housing demand in certain areas. That sounds like a pro to me. But again, like, if it's a market that required that kind of stimulation to grow, okay. But I would say that's on the developers for picking, like developing in the wrong spot. Like if you're in California right now, less demand for housing is good. Any of these overcrowded areas, less demand is good, right? So like there's definitely the potential for, so on the negatives here, like environmental regulation rollback, like I'm not a, the world's gonna end climate change, boohoo, like that's not my thing. I think that it's funny or silly to assume that over millions or billions or whatever of years that the US, that the country's been around or the world's been around that we are somehow gonna make enough of a dent to ruin the world when it's just as likely that like the earth gets a degree off course for some reason, and that destroys us. Like, I kind of think it's silly to be like, who are we to assume that we're ruining everything and it's not just like environmental changes over time and they come back and there's cycles like everything else. That being said, I don't know enough about that space. Again, please no hate in the comments. I'm not trying to be a climate guy. I see, you're right, he's gonna be less economic or uh, eco-friendly and less green, you know, uh, policy, whatever. I, to me, that's not necessarily something that I'm super concerned about, but it may be for some of you. Um, there are going to be like trade tariffs and stuff like that. I mean, again, I think that's by design. So there's some downside to that. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, here's the thing, right? As you look at Trump and, and Kamala, and we'll get to Kamala in a second. I almost kind of look at, and I've kind of looked at the last two or three elections this way. I feel like the Republican side is like the strict parent who tells you no, and the Democratic side is like the cool or wannabe cool parent that tells you yes. And so one side is more like long-term logic-based, this is what you need to hear whether you like it or not, and the other side feels more like this is what you want to hear, this is what you think we should work on, you know. I don't want to call it pandering, but it's, it's the difference. And if you look at big cities, this is kind of what happens cyclically. Right, so a city's normal size, as it grows, 
the bigger cities get, the more they lean blue or democratic. And I think it's because in a lot of ways, as they grow, it becomes more of a popularity game for politics and people, uh, you know, they, they try to, they, as, as generations change, people growing up say, Hey, instead of moving somewhere that I want this thing, I'm going to try to make this thing available here. And we create these policies that, uh, are very pro citizen in that town, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but almost to the detriment of what makes sense for the town itself. And that's where it becomes kind of a bad thing. It's just like, nobody wants to say a large portion of the homeless population self-inflicted and it, it is their problem, not ours. And therefore, like, yes, we have shelters. Yes, we take care of them, but we're not going to like pay them for X, Y, Z. We need to rehabilitate them into society. Like that all makes me sound like an asshole. But if you go the other route of like, let's support them and pay them and make their life easier and cater and pander to them, you're enabling people who in a large chunk of the population made poor decisions to continue making poor decisions. So there's gotta be like a balance there between the two, right? And, and, and again, I should probably reference like, I hate the two party system. I'm, I'm very neutral. I think there's a middle ground here. I, I um, but again, this isn't about my pol political stance and whatever. So, uh, now Kamala Harris, right? Focus on affordable housing. So she's got that $25,000 down payment assistance that she wants to do. I think her heart's in the right place with this. I think, and I think this kind of panders to the, like, you know, the cool parent, like what they want thing, because here's the downside. Um, a, this would not be for nearly as many, I think there's going to be stipulations to this that would make it for a very small subsect of the population. So it wouldn't be that big of an effect. But if this went like nationwide, then house prices would just jump $25,000 like, or $20,000. Like it would, the market would just reflect that. And so it wouldn't actually accomplish. It'd be like, oh, well, we're basically going to take your 25,000 and it'll help with your down payment, but we're going to roll it into the loan. So like, instead of buying a $400,000 house, you're buying a $425,000 house. Yes, you have assistance with the down payments, so you can get into it, but long-term it's still going to cost you more. So there's like a double-edged sword to that. Um, which is why like, and I'm, Hey, I love like the FHA three and a half percent down the VA zero down. Like that's one of the things that I think being in the military is, is one of our best benefits. And so I'm all for low down payment or, you know, helping with the down payment to get into a property. I just worry that if you, if the market adapts to add that into uh, the house price, then it, it still makes your mortgage more expensive, makes things more expensive. It, it, it's still not a true, as true a win as it's portrayed, but still a win, right? And, I, and if it's for a small enough subsect, like people who actually like first time home buyer, not like anytime you use a primary residence mortgage, but like no shit, you have never bought a house before. I think it, I think it could be a beneficial policy. I will say, I also worry about where that money comes from because that leads me to believe anytime there's an additional program bonus stipend thing, the money comes from somewhere and it's taxes. So it comes from us, right? So I'm also iffy on that side where it's like, it'd be cool to give people 25 grand to buy their first house. But if I'm paying a portion of that for you to buy your first house, I'm not as cool with that as I am with like just lowering house prices so you can buy a house. Yeah. Infrastructure investment, they both want the infrastructure to be better, right? Yeah. Um, the climate friendly policies, right? So this, they're right. This could very well spur some innovation. Um, this does better energy efficient construction is big. So I, I like that. I like the idea of more energy efficient homes and, and, and solar and, and all of that. And like kind of the more self-sustained grid, you know, side, I'd, I'd like it more if a lot of that solar was built in the U S. Um, but I think, you know, this can create job growth. Uh, this can create, uh, you know, it's going to benefit real estate investors by, uh, that, that focus on sustaining development. So like, I don't think we lose from bolstering innovation in the real estate space, in the climate space. I just worry that there's enough people that will like just kind of cut corners to be green and get all these, this money that it, it may, there's always that piece. I'm so iffy on the tax relief social program. Like this is talking about how economic stability, potential continuation for progressive policies that are bolstering the middle class. 
the progress this doesn't help the middle class mm -hmm. like go read a book on communism marxism socialism whatever like it helps the middle class in the short term and it hurts the entire economy in the long term so i'm not a fan of like the idea of like tax the rich give to the poor like it sounds great by nature but what ends up happening is you tax the rich and then the tax worked so now you spend more money and you then tax the middle class and the poor with the same policy that you were aiming at just the, the rich so like this whole tax pr proposed tax on uh, unrealized capital gains is proposed at only people over a hundred million dollar net worth and so people are like oh well you know doesn't bother me no it, if you look at taxes historically they almost never stopped there they they okay we introduced it for people with a hundred million dollar net worth it worked now we're gonna go 50 million now we're gonna go 10 million now we'll go a million now we're gonna this is gonna be a policy for everybody like that's my fear I can't say that's gonna happen but that's my fear because if you don't understand the taxing of unrealized gains that's terrifying like that means that you would get taxed on things that have quote gone up in value when you haven't benefited from the gone up in value yet and so like a real estate property goes up a hundred thousand dollars and you owe them taxes on that even though you haven't sold the property like that's I don't like that um, this this coupled with I think President Biden President Biden had at one point they were throwing around the idea of reducing the step up cost basis so that you would have to pay taxes when you inherit things rather than inheriting it at current value and the downside to that would be like farmers for example like let's say you bought a farm for you know over the last 50 years you were paying eight dollars an acre twelve dollars an acre you know hundred dollars an acre thousand dollars an acre five thousand dollars an acre eight thousand dollars an acre let's say it averaged out to a thousand bucks an acre and you own a hundred acres that's a hundred thousand dollars but current value of that might be eight to twelve thousand dollars and so if it's twelve thousand dollars now your hundred thousand dollars worth of real estate is worth 1.2 which is great unless you pass away and your family inherits this one point two million dollar farm but has to pay taxes on that which is three hundred thousand dollars four hundred thousand dollars you know probably be yeah probably be right around three hundred thousand dollars well I don't know about you but I don't have three hundred thousand dollars to pay for the piece of land that my dad had that he's giving to me because he passed away and so that family farm is gone and more importantly if you had to pay at the cost up the step up cost basis like the modern rate most farms today like if you if you bought a farm today at full market value, you would not be profitable. Almost guaranteed. I mean, it depends on the, the scheme, whatever, but like, it's not a sound investment. It, it's got to be passed down and at a discount and all these things because, it, or you're going to have to build a much bigger machine because of how much real estate prices have gone up and how little cost of goods for dairy and meat and everything else have gone up. Like, there's a disparity there. And so I was looking at this with my former father in law. He's a cattle farmer. He was cattle farmer of the year a few years back for Missouri. And uh, I, I was looking at this with him and I was like, dude, like if the step up cost basis went away and somebody inherited your farm at current value, they would lose an arm and a leg to keep this place alive. And, like it just wouldn't work. And so those kinds of policies scare me because yes, they quote tax the rich because that's a rich farmer, but he's not a rich farmer. He just has land that went up in value. Like there's a downside to a lot of these tax policies. And so I lean towards the side of spend less money, need less taxes over tax the quote unquote rich to cause the lifestyle that we need. This is the idea, the ideology of like, I could buy a Toyota Camry, save a lot more money, invest that money and down the road be able to buy a Porsche. Or I could buy a Challenger or a Mustang or whatever other military expensive vehicle, not save as much money, and down the road not be able to afford a Porsche, but I had the Challenger. So it's like I'm a long-term play, you know, guy, and I hope that you guys are as well. All right, let's see here. So some cons, right? So we talked about higher corporate capital gains tax, the unrealized tax game. Uh, all that stuff is, is tough. Tighter regulation, right? So like I think tighter regulation on financial markets, environmental standards, um, and housing markets, 
as long as they're the right regulations, it's whatever. But unfortunately, I think a lot of these regulations have a byproduct effect of ending up like California, where it might take you six months to get permits approved for a house, or Hawaii, where you know it's such a long process for permitting that almost nothing on the island of Oahu is permitted because people just don't wait. They just do their thing. And so I, I worry that those are some of the things that we could run into with the regulation side of stuff. And I hope that we're able to avoid that. Um, I'm not a rent control guy. I think that's the wrong answer. And uh, I could go into that a lot, but uh, let's let's kind of keep this. that The tenant side of things, the landlord side of things, that, that's a touchy subject for a lot of people. Um, Suffice it to say, rent control doesn't really keep rents down and it only hurts like the landlord. And, uh, you know, I get it, BlackRock, whatever, but like most landlords are mom and pop. So if, if I'm trying to make my family better and I'm being punished and can't make my family better because of your bad financial decisions, that doesn't sit well with me. And, and I say bad financial decisions because yes, we live in a consumer market and most people that are struggling financially, I'm not gonna say most people struggling financially it, are all self-inflicted, but in a lot of cases, you're spending money on things that you don't need to keep up with the Joneses and it, it's an expense issue more than an income issue. Or you're not putting in the work to increase your income, right? You're not learning skills. You're not trying to bring value to the marketplace. While I sympathize with renters costs, right? And I don't gouge my tenants by any means. I also sympathize with the mom and pop landlord who has to keep up with higher energy costs and higher insurance costs and higher interest rates in order to provide that housing. So it's, it's a double edged sword, right? The rising interest rates thing. Yeah. The inflation stuff, all of that, not so great for the real estate economy. Um, increased government spending. We kind of talked about this already. Uh, you know, it leads to the inflationary side of stuff, but it also leads to the need for taxes. And so I have been, for a long time, I've been saying that the U.S. needs a mean parent. We need the parent that tells us no in our best interest, even when we want something. And we don't like that, and it's not going to be fun, and we make that person the bad guy, and that's human nature, and I get that. But at the end of the day, that's, that's what the U.S. needs. We need the person that's going to say, nope, we're shutting down this nice program and this nicety and this program and these things. And also, no, we're not sending aid to all these other countries. We're using it here. And we need the person who's going to cut back on spending and back on luxuries and back on niceties, which none of us will like, in order to reduce the need for taxes and therefore taxes. More so than we need the person who's gonna do all the things we want and then on the back end be like, oops, inflation, oops, taxes. Um, and, and I'm, that's political party aside. I, I'm not, both policies have some semblance of all of that mixed into their policies, right? Um, now we're not gonna get into all the like racist, sexist, gender, uh, like things, because let's be real, and I'm gonna just say this right now. Um, I don't think it's the government's job to worry about your choice in who you date or go home with, to worry about your choice in what gender you feel you are, to worry about your feelings in general. And there's a lot of other things that go into your feelings, right? It's not all this world of uh, LGBTQ, gender, like all of that. There's a lot of stuff that plays into it. That's just the biggest field that's discussed right now. I would personally like to see less government involvement in all of that, less regulation. That doesn't mean I'm against these things. In fact, that means I could care less about who you are or what you do, as long as the who you are and what you do does not affect my who you are and what you do. So if you wanna change genders, marry somebody of the same gender, whatever, I don't care. But I, again, I don't wanna be paying taxes for it. I don't know if I said that right. Please don't cancel me. I don't hate you if you're 
a different gender, race, whatever. I don't care. I judge you based on who you are. So how you act and who you are means a lot more to me than what you look like or who you go to bed with. And it should for you too. Hopefully that came off decent. Hopefully I made it through this video in a way that gives some good feedback and talking points in the comments and, and maybe you know we'll come up with something in the comments that's a worthwhile topic to really deep dive politically, like policy-wise, not politically, uh, but policy-wise, we'll deep dive and really go into it. And uh, again, remember, shame people who get angry in the comments and bring emotion into this because that'll be funny. And uh, I don't know, if you found this valuable, if, this, if I did this well, share it with somebody and subscribe. And either way, hope you have a great day. I love you all.